Zach, 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 Thank you. Wow, what a reception. Uh, I didn't know what this would be like, and uh, looking out, I'm so happy that it seems so so quaint with so much character. You know what? First of all, I'd just like to tell you that I am incredibly flattered and very grateful to be welcomed and invited to do this. Um, and the movement to me is it's not just this kind of theoretical thing, it's people that I meet all over the country and the one common denominator that I constantly find is just big hearts and, and great intentions um, and a lot of passion. And um, so I just want to say thank you, first of all. Um, And then I guess the second thing I want to just say is that I think that this is a really, really exciting time to be involved in tiny houses, to be exploring with the different kind of designs and just trying to find ways to make people's lives fit. And, um, and so I see, I see so many people, really smart people, putting their energy into it and that's why I say it's so exciting uh, and there's just new cool things coming out all the time. Being here is great for me because I get to actually see what some of the other people are doing. Um, and yeah, just congratulations. Everybody does a great job. So let's see. The third thing that I'd like to say is that um, somehow I found myself on a television show where I think that it definitely is, has been the point of first contact for a lot of people when they start hearing about the tiny houses and tiny house movement and to me that comes with a big responsibility um, because I actually do believe in tiny houses not as just like a great way to kind of get out of debt and this and that I really believe in it as a way that we can start working on living more harmoniously in this world um, and I think Jeez, I'm kind of nervous. I have to put this down. I'm like shaking a little bit. So um, I just really feel like it is a fantastic thing on so many different levels. And the motivations that people have for why they're interested in tiny houses is incredibly diverse. And so is the people that I run into when I actually... I'm just blown away with the variety of people that are into this. And for just totally different reasons. Um, and... Uh, and it really is, is huge, and, and I think that our world is, is asking, is begging for us to start coming up with some solutions, and I think what we're doing is trying to use our brain power to solve the problem. And I think that it's gonna be requiring a lot of brain power, which requires time from smart people and energy to find solutions. And then the other piece of it that doesn't get talked about as much, but it's also gonna require, I think, a lot of heart, um, out of people and a fair amount of discipline just a little bit you know I don't like to like talk about that too much but I don't think the world's gonna kinda live harmoniously with humans without us kind of reevaluating what we do and how we live our lives and so it requires intelligence heart and also a little bit of discipline and um, You know, one thing that I have noticed is that my generation isn't super good with discipline. And, um, you know, we, yeah, we're passionate, we have heart and stuff, but when it comes to kind of sacrificing the things that we love, uh, or I'm not going to say that, because I don't actually, I'm not an advocate at all for sacrificing the things that we love. It's actually the total opposite. But what I have recognized is that I think the older generation is starting to get it faster than the younger generation in terms of that what we're doing with this planet isn't actually working and we need to kind of reevaluate ourselves. And so in the position of kind of being this, this maybe a, somewhat of a spokesman for the movement, what I'm really trying to do is just be a very good messenger so that the message doesn't have a chance to be lost on the messenger. And um, 
Did I say that right? I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so in that capacity, you know, I do take it very seriously, and I and I think that um, if I can offer anything for us and for our world, it's to try to make the ability and the in, the intention of moving tiny seem as positive as possible, where we don't have to sacrifice the things that we love in order to kind of be part of it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that we do that on varying degrees and in the show, that's not always what I get to advocate, but advocate, but however, I do believe strongly that tiny is this word that's relative to perspective and what you kind of think of as tiny is just completely um, dependent on what you're used to. Um, and so what I, you know, it's not a very sexy, but I like to actually replace it with adequate. Um, because I think that's more important. And I think that uh, it is actually very important for people to kind of reflect on, on what they need to live happily and then find that balance with, you know, the place that they have versus their lifestyle and try to kind of bring those together and then really maybe question ourselves just a little bit and, and uh, maybe just edge on the side of restraint a little bit when it comes to our materialism and when we decide what we need to be happy. Be real serious about it. Um, because I think it's no news news to anyone here that like what really matters is not the things that we possess, but it's the, the connections that we have with our family and our community. It really is important to have a roof over your head and have your belly full and feel secure in order to be happy. But once you get past that, I mean, it really just comes down to your relations and uh, how you're treated by the people that you come in contact with. Um, so I thought that I would first kind of tell you guys a little bit about like me and where I came from and how the heck I ever got on a television show. Um, so I think many people know that I'm a skier. Um, yeah. And like, okay, when you say I'm a skier, it's not very descriptive for what I was doing. Um, I was a ski bum. And in terms of a ski bum, I was actually on the very extreme far sides of the bum aspect of that. <laughs> and so what that really means is that I had found this thing that I loved that was like really places that, experiences that made me feel like I'm almost close to heaven, you know, and I'm not a religious person, but you get into these places and you cannot not feel that power. And so I'd been exposed to that and I just knew that for whatever reason, I needed to form a life that allowed me to pursue that thing that I loved, which happened to be being in the mountains. And not just skiing down the slopes, you know, not just making turns, but, but to find yourself in these most amazing places on the most amazing days where you find that like spiritual connection with the world and then have it all kind of tie back into like this ability to experience it and appreciate it on a really high level, which is where the skis came in. You know, so skis really were just a vehicle for me to explore the world and do it in a way that I was really appreciative of that. Um, and so that's why skiing, it wasn't just a, a hobby, it was actually my full life. And I, and I had turned it into kind of a project of passion to try to find a way to make it pay for itself. Um, so that I could continue doing it and I wouldn't fall into the scenario where so many people do where they have a passion but the reality is the world take over and now you're stuck kind of paying for all those realities. Um, and so really in that process of being a ski bum, I had been living in a very minimalist uh, mindset for a long time. And the whole idea that you're going to prioritize um, just having the, avail the availability of the time as well that you're not actually forced to be working on those moments that's nothing new to the ski world and so this kind of whole like you know valuing the um, the experience over the material is something that's just ingrained in the culture and so you know I kind of waited for I was like competitive guy and I was having a hard time getting enough time to actually 
train enough that I was going to be competitive. And it kind of dawned on me that I had to totally change my life if I wanted to be serious about it. And um, I had an experience in my life when I was younger that was not positive, and I won't go into it, but it was this catalyst for me to say, you know what, that's it. Like, I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to make this big change. And I think a lot of people run into that type of event. Um, so for me, it just happened to be my old little brother was just graduating. Okay. He was just graduating high school. And uh, so I was able to make this, this leap, this change by by quitting my job and moving to a different state and, uh, and finding the place that I wanted to be instead of, instead of just trying to work and save up money and then have the ability to adventure. It was like, no, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to cut out the requirements for me to work, being like, I'm not going to pay for anything. And uh, <laughs> it was, I was pretty good at it. Um, I moved to Washington and uh, got a job at Mount Baker with my little brother. Okay. Oh yes. I will prom I promise I will only speak as long as I want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, or until I see people yawning because I I'm I'm known to rant a little bit. It's uh it's difficult on the television show because they don't have time for ranting. It's like you only have like if you want something to say something intelligent, you have to say it within like 8 seconds or it won't make air. But if you want to do something really dorky, it doesn't matter how long it takes, they're going to play it. So, like, if you want to make fun of yourself, it's going in for sure. Um, but if you want to get deep and actually have some, like, intellectual back and forth, it, you have to do it in a really truncated fashion, which is not my main skill set. So, uh, yeah, um, I was talking just kind of about moving to, moving to Washington, and, and what it really was was, yeah, me scaling back on the requirements to make money by you know, living in my van. I bought an RV when I moved out there. I didn't know where I was going to live. So I bought a really crappy RV that had a hole in the roof. So I, first thing I did was I took the roof off of it and then the whole thing was like terrible shag carpet. So I had to put in uh, wood floors and I did the interior really nice. But no matter what I could do, the exterior was horrible. And, and um, in the process of moving to Washington, what I also learned about was a stigma that follows people that have mobile living opportunities or, you know, however it comes to it. I experienced the stigma of just being the guy that lives in the RV. And it was something that was never quite settling for me because what the, I haven't talked about is in order to pay for my life, I had been building homes. And uh, I was really into it, and I really enjoyed the artistic part of it, and I respected the quality, and I was fortunate enough to do some really nice stuff for very wealthy people. So for me to go in my daily day-to-day -day and then return to a home that was something else, it didn't, it didn't, feel, um, it didn't feel good. And especially to, to come back into an RV that kind of also had that stigma was a little bit difficult. So, first thing I did after I moved out of the RV was move into a little cabin that was about 100 years old with my little brother sharing a room and four other people, five dogs, like four cats, and uh, the thing was not more than 400 square feet. So, I didn't know it was a tiny house, but it definitely was, and we barely fit. Um, and, and really, that just kind of started a whole long line of me exploring the different options for living cheaply. Um, so that I could kind of follow this this passion and it went from you know sleeping on couches to little cheap rooms with my little brother to my RV which lasted not as long as I wanted it to and then I really struck gold when I bought a van because <laughs> uh, it was it offered some things that the RV didn't and mostly it, it wasn't an eyesore the same way and so my reception for being able to visit people and um, you know, it, it wasn't as impactful. I could take this thing to the grocery store. I didn't feel bad driving around because it was this massive gas hog. Um, and it just worked in my life. It worked for my life really well. And I put a wood stove in it and I really did put some real time in some really snowy places all by myself. And it was some of the uh, happiest moments of my life, you know, it was like really beautiful and I felt super accomplished and I was on this kind of war path trying to be a pro skier 
which that doesn't, that just means that you're like having a subsidized existence and <laughs> risking your life every day to do it. Um, but it was beautiful and it was just a project that made me feel very gratified. And somehow, later on, uh, this crazy thing happened where I was happy with my van, I was doing my thing, but I met a girl and um, we were really, I was about to, ready to do anything to make that happen. And uh, one of the things that was going on is that, okay, no matter, anytime you meet someone else and you're going to start a relationship, especially if you're a boy and they're a girl, there's going to be a conversation that happens where they go back to their parents and they tell them about this amazing guy they just met. <laughs> and uh, eventually that conversation is going to get around to, all right, well, what does he do and where does he live? And it's really difficult for, the, for a woman to go and explain to her parents that this guy is amazing and he does so many good things, makes me feel so good. But guess what? He lives in his van and he only works in the summer. And, and you know, it's... So I was trying to find a way where we had already kind of solidified our relationship and we were kind of coming together to try to plan on how we're going to get a life that was really the beautiful existence that we wanted for both of us. And uh, my van didn't really fit into that equation very well. And I was um, playing ping pong with my dad and his friends. He's got these kooky old friends. And, and one of them was like, hey, you're, have you heard about this tiny house thing? I mean, I'm sure you guys have had similar experiences. And, uh, and I said, no, no. And he's like, oh, you have to see this. So you know, he brought me on to uh, Jay Schaefer's website at the time. And really my first thought was like, wait, are you kidding me? This is legal? You know, it wasn't, there was nothing in my mind of like, whoo, that would be hard. Like, mm, I don't know if I could do that. It was like this, I was looking at this as a massive upscale in my life. And so it's kind of funny because now I work on this TV show where we go strictly to people who are trying to downsize. Um, and there's a little bit of me not really being able to sympathize a whole lot sometimes. So that's where John takes over and he does a great job. Um, he sympathizes with all their first world issues and um, I don't have to be, you know, the one that does that. So, okay, so yeah, we're, uh, where was I? Um, oh yeah, so that's right. I mentioned that it was, you know, I was building houses. See, carpentry is this great job for people like me because it's kind of seasonal. I mean, people do do it all winter long, but most employers will understand if you're going to be just like, you know, hitting it hard for six months and then go do something else. And so that's why it worked with me. And that's why I kind of say like skiing legitimately, if you're doing it seriously, is a gateway drug to carpentry. And <laughs> it's, I mean, go to a ski town, check it out. It's, it's real. Um, and, uh, and, and carpentry was another thing because I always had thought of myself as an artist. And it's extremely hard. Is this my beer? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize it was this kind of event. Yeah. Cheers, guys. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so carpentry kind of came into play, and it, and it was something that I started to take really seriously because it was this artistic outlet um, which there's not a lot of good ways to get paid as an artist and so if you find one you got to hold on to that pretty good so I was doing that and I had a great buddy my my buddy Paul you guys should all meet him he's if you think I'm a good builder like this guy taught me everything I know and he's still been at it and I only did it part-time and he's been full-time so this guy's the real deal, and he's here with me. He's tall, you can't miss him. He's over there. Go harass him. If you have questions about building, that guy will answer it with a different degree of confidence than anybody else, I promise. Um, and he's also an amazing person just to have been around. And he did this beautiful thing, which he kept a job open for me. And so I got to come back, and, and uh, I could go adventure and you know, go spend spend my money to my last dime and have get myself into these kind of hard places and I knew all I had to do was find some way to get a plane ticket, plus he'd buy my plane ticket back. <laughs> and then 10 bucks for the bus, I could show up in my tool belt and get to work that day. And so it's, it's that kind of security 
that allows people to go and, and push themselves and go do beautiful things. And I think that that actually is my favorite part of all of the amazing parts about Tiny Houses. That's my favorite piece. Yeah. Is, is, is the ability to, for people to have that place that's their own. And that's why it, it really doesn't matter what size it is. You know, it matters that it's yours and that it's secure and that you feel comfortable there. Because once you have that, your ability to go adventure and push yourself becomes so much greater. And your ability to go and pursue the career that you didn't think that you could do because it's not gonna pay, but you love it, uh, all of a sudden becomes possible. And so for me, my tiny house was my buddy Paul because he was that safety net that I had. Um, and it was, a, it was a huge thing for me. So I don't wanna talk the whole time about myself. Um, Let's see, we already went through a whole lot of what I would written down here. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so, you know, we talked about my, my thing about that it was this really upscale thing for me to do to get into a tiny house. And I built a beautiful one and I was super proud of it. And then I also had this amazing experience where at the same time, my long, lifelong held goal of like really trying to turn the skiing thing into something that might help me and, and pay for myself was actually starting to happen. And so I was able to team up with my main sponsor at the time that helped me build the house with funds and also helped me create this tour that put me on the road going to different ski areas and absolutely living the dream, guys. Like, absolutely. My dream was I, I met that dream and then it got completely sidelined by this new dream that was so much more amazing than I could have expected. And I'm not talking about the television show. I'm talking about me having put everything on the back burner to kind of pursue this thing for 15 years and then after, you know, so much time that my family even gave up on the opportunity that it would happen, it started to happen and, and the gratification is immense when that sort of long-held passion starts to get realized. So. Anyways, it was also this amazing girl in my life, and we just had this really beautiful existence, and the tiny house had facilitated that on a, on a level I couldn't imagine, because we were traveling from places to places that were not just any places. These are like the places that I want to spend my life, like those spots. And then we were taking the commute completely out of it. And what I found from, from doing that process is that in a tiny house, when you're used to driving even half an hour to go skiing, and then you know getting a car, doing all the setup, driving back at night, you got your house there. There's dirty dishes waiting for you. This is the whole thing. It like you don't end up having much free time. And what I found in the tiny house was it's right there in the parking lot. I come right back after skiing, no commuting, just start in on making dinner. There's nothing to clean, and you're left with this empty, I call it a vacuum of time. And that vacuum of time turned into such a special thing for me because I recognized that in my life before that, I never was bored because I was so busy, you know? And I remembered this thing from like childhood of boredom. It's like, oh yeah, what is that? Like when you don't have anything to do? Um, so for me, I, I, I wasn't bored, I just remembered all of my passions and all of my hobbies. And at nighttime when we'd come down, we would get dinner done by seven o'clock, have the dishes done, you're not tired, you still got two hours with this person you're in love with, all alone in this like really romantic setting, and you're able to fill that time with the things that we other, otherwise don't get to, like reading books, I play guitar, you know, we would have dance parties. I mean, we had like some intensely romantic scenarios going on that happened almost every day, and it was just really beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, for me, that's that's been something that I talk about that people don't quite get. You know, is that that scenario where you're gonna have a have a free moment in your life, which a lot of us don't get to. And when you have that free moment, that's when you get to better yourself. That's when you get to put your put your energy back into yourself and um, and work on those hobbies and remember that you like to read and 
you know. I'm, I'm like totally disappointed. I learned to play guitar when I was like 15 and I kind of crescendoed about 17 and I've just been trying to maintain ever since then. <laughs> so for me to like actually get a moment where I can put it back in and get better, this is, I'm like really excited about that. So of course I don't get to do that anymore um, because all of this kind of led into me working on a television show. And uh, the one thing that I do know about the show is that it wasn't anything that I expected um, in terms of how it went. And it's a way bigger commitment. And I've basically, since getting hired on it, I've been working almost nonstop. And I was home five times in 15 months. And um, it's like this intensely, I mean, it's intense workload. We're trying to build these houses in a, a ridiculously short amount of time. And then we have one day of travel and we just go right back into the next one. And so for me, it's been an exhausting thing that is also so gratifying. And the thing that really keeps me going is I believe so much in the tiny house movement and these tiny houses as being kind of a vehicle for people to explore making a change in whatever it is. And there, I'll talk about the variety of interest in this, but there's so many different reasons, but what ends up happening is people use it for a tool to kind of make a change in their scenario, whether it's their contribution in the, the environmental scenario we got going on, or if it's their you know, ability to live debt free and have the comfort that comes with that. Um, a lot of these, these problems that we have in the world are, you know, whether it's the environmental issue, whether it's the economy that's kind of constri constricting people, they can feel like such big issues that as small people, like what can we do? And the tiny houses actually, I think, allow people to think maybe actually I can ha have a difference and there is something I can do and I think that that's a really special piece of it and it's not just environmental I mean the environmental thing is just totally obscene right now um, and it's and it's actually demanding real attention from everyone on the planet as Americans we have a bigger incentive I believe that as Americans we have a bigger incentive to watch the example that we set for the rest of the world because it's a small planet and what's happened is that for a while now and maybe it's changed a little bit but we've been looked to as americans to kind of like explain to people what good life really looks like so then they see our lifestyle and they want to emulate it and the reality is that there's not enough room in this world for 2500 square foot homes for six billion people um, we're going to let him have a drink of his beer for a second here. Thank you, Jack. Um, we're going to give you just a couple more minutes to wrap up here. Just take a minute, drink your beer, and uh, come up with like, you know, do you have a couple sentences? <laughs> you want me to truncate things? Do you, do, you have, like, do you have like two more left? Do you have like a few more sentences left? Yeah, we can end it right now. I'm fine. <laughs> Actually, we're not quite done yet. So first of all, we're gonna we're gonna let him gather his thoughts and drink your beer. Okay. Drink your beer. <laughs> we're gonna let him gather his thoughts. We're gonna let him write his closing here. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Zach, we don't get to ask him now. I'm I'm however <laughs> want to let you know that he will be back. He'll be right here on the stage. We have an expert panel this afternoon at 5.30. So from 5.30 to 6.30, you'll be have the opportunity to ask some questions of our expert panels, and he will be here as well. So um, with that, I'm, I'm gonna give it back to you for a few more minutes, okay? Okay, I promise I'll get right to the meat of, of the message here. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit before that I believe tiny, I mean, it's a great term, it's very, I love the term tiny, but I don't think that it really is exactly what I try to advocate. And what I'm trying to advocate is something called adequate. And adequate means looking at your life and seeing what you need for happiness and trying to customize your home to accommodate that and trying to be realistic with yourself about it. Um, and yeah, I, I meet people all the time that are trying to go into tiny houses and I don't think that they should. You know, because it's not adequate. Like they actually do need a little more space or regardless, 
sometimes people get into the idea of tiny homes and they feel like once they do it, that's it. And they're just going to have to deal with that. And, it's, and to me, it's ridiculous because your life is going to change. Your need for space is going to change so much throughout your life, depending on if you have a family, depending on when your kids leave. And I think that it's really just about trying to, trying to form the living space that is adequate for you at that moment in, in time. And um, so, so that's, that's kind of one of the things that I was kind of here to say. And, and, and the other thing is that I have a message of unity for you guys. I think that one thing that has been really amazing in our movement that's allowed it to grow to this place is that it started from a very welcoming, uh, friendly, open place. And I think that it's really important that we remember that and we try to keep it that way because what I'm trying to do is spread the message across the land and try to make it as appetizing for people so that they can start to consider the, the, the actual facts about what it is and not just kind of like think about what their, you know, their neighbor might say or something, but they can actually make up the decision on their own because somehow... I mean, if I do my job right, then it seems fun and cool and like you could expand your life and that's the type of thing that I hope will inspire other people to consider it. And the whole reason that I want to do this is because I feel like our world is demanding it from us. Um, and so I know that there is a very, it's a wide variety of people that are interested in tiny houses. Not all of it is environmental, not all of it is economical. They're all coming from different directions, and I think what's important for us is not to try to value one of the motivations over the other and, uh, and, and allow people to, whatever reason it is that motivates them to kind of scale down. I think that that's, that's what we need to encourage, and that's what I'm here to tell you.